the truth about hell is our next talk. So what is the truth about the Bible's description of consuming fire and eternal burnings that are consistent with the scripture? We do not want to deny scripture, yet also harmonizes with God's design laws, the law of love and the law of liberty. This is our goal. Let's include all the scripture. Let's see where it takes us. Let's look at the evidence. Let's see what's being described. And also understand how that works in conjunction with how we understand love works. Because we know God cannot be saying we understand the law of liberty. Before we even look at the evidence, we know that you can't get love by threatening to torture people who don't love you. So there must be some other understanding that the Bible will give us to harmonize with law and of love and liberty. So Isaiah 33, 14, the sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with the everlasting burnings? Some versions say eternal burnings. And I ask people, well, what is this describing? And most people say, well, that's hell. That's that place of eternal burning and consuming fire. But notice what the next verse, very next verse in Isaiah 33, 15 tells us who dwells there. Who dwells there? He who walks righteously and speaks what is right, who rejects gain from extortion and keeps his hand from accepting bribes, who stops his ears against plots of murder and shuts his eyes against contemplating evil. Whoa, the first time I read this, I was like a deer in the headlights. I was going, this does not compute. This is not what I have been conditioned and taught my whole life to believe. I was taught my whole life the, play, the people that are wicked, the evil are the ones in this fiery, tormenting, consuming place of eternal burning. But, the, but Isaiah is saying, no, 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 it's the righteous that are here. So I had to dig into my Bible and look a little closer. And I started to examine all the places I could find this language being used. And I found something very interesting. When Moses talked to God at the bush, the bush was described as consuming fire. But the bush didn't get burned up. When God came and gave the law at Sinai, the Bible describes this, that there was a consuming fire. But the mountain did not melt like a nuclear weapon hit it. When Solomon's temple was dedicated and God's presence came at the day of dedication, the, the priest could not enter the temple because the brightness of God's fiery glory was too intense for them. They couldn't tolerate it. But the building did not burn down. It says in Ezekiel that Lucifer, prior to his fall, used to walk among the fiery stones of God's presence. In Daniel chapter 7, it says, when the Ancient of Days takes his throne, rivers of fire come out from before him, and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands are standing in this fire. It says in Hebrews 12, 29, and this is a big one, our God is a consuming fire. In Revelation, it says that the new Jerusalem will not need a sun or a moon to light it because God's presence will be his light. And the lie of Satan that he's perpetrated on the entire world, regardless of denominational background, is the place you don't want to go and the place you don't want to be is the place of eternal burning and consuming fire. But the Bible tells us that place is God's very presence. The righteous are transformed just as Moses' face after 40 days in God's presence on the mountain. He comes down. What's his face doing? It's radiating something that looks like fire. But did Moses have third degree burns? Did his whiskers catch fire? No. But when the people saw his face, they shrank back. Why? Is, was it because they didn't have asbestos shields on? In other words, was it because of the physical heat? No, it wasn't because of physical heat. It was because this is the fires of God's glorious love, love and truth. And those whose characters and hearts are solidified in fear and selfishness, they can't tolerate the light of love and truth. It caused them pain. So Moses had to cover his face. And it says that the wicked, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, are destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. Uh, this is a very strange fire. Here we have fire that destroys the wicked, but heals and transforms the righteous. 
You see, this is because it's a fire that consumes sin. And what is sin made out of? If I get a piece of wood, is sin made out of wood? If I cut off your big toe, do I get a piece of sin? Sin is not made out of physical matter. What we call fire, known as combustion, rapid oxidation of physical matter, will burn physical matter. But sin is not made out of physical matter. You can't burn sin with physical fire. Sin is made out of lies and selfishness. Satan is the father of lies, and lies believed result in fear and selfishness. What is it that will consume, burn out a lie? Truth. What is it that will consume or burn out selfishness? Love. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and love. And at Pentecost, when the Spirit fell, they saw two streams or two forks or two tongues of fire. The fires of truth and the fires of love fell upon them, and no one got hurt. They were transformed. Notice this. In Leviticus 10, 1 through 5, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu take unauthorized fire in before the Lord, and fire comes out from the Lord's presence and consumes them, and they die before the Lord. Moses summons their cousins and says to them, come here, carry your cousins outside the camp. And notice what scripture says, it's quite profound. This is evidence-based thinking. So they came and carried them still in their tunics outside the camp. Now, if I hit you with a flamethrower and burn you till you're dead, will you still be in your clothing when I'm done? What does that tell you about this fire? This is not the fire of combustion This is the fire of truth and love. That they, Nadab and Abihu, suddenly found themselves in the presence of unveiled truth and unveiled love, and their corruption of character was consumed by the purity of God's holiness. What happens to those who solidify themselves in lies and selfishness when they come into the unveiled presence of infinite love and infinite truth. See, I have patients who I work with who have been abused, and oftentimes in the process of working with them, they will come to the point, they say, I just wish my uncle would admit what he did. I wish my grandfather would admit what they did. I just wish they'd admit it. And I said, take that at face value. Let's just take that and process through what that would mean. If the person who molested you actually genuinely truly admits it, won't that mean they will have to go through a period of guilt, shame, self-loathing, self-disgust? Won't they have to go through that experience if they're truly honest about what they've done? And if they do that here today on earth, aren't they still under the umbrella of God's grace working to heal and save them? Isn't there still peace to be found in Jesus Christ for their heart? What will it be like for those who've permanently hardened themselves and they face unveiled love and truth so they have the full knowledge where their denial, their distortions, their externalizations, their blaming of others no longer works because they're in the rivers of love and truth and infinite love and truth and they now have full awareness of their own evil character as well as the awareness of the pain and suffering they've caused others. There will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals on his head. Origen of Alexandria uh, wrote, a scripture indicates that every sinner kindles for himself the flame of his own fire and is not plunged into a fire which has been previously kindled by someone else or which existed before him. He understood that the torment of soul comes from unremedied sin in the sinner when they can no longer pile up lies and distortions to avoid the reality of their own corruption. Notice Lucifer's end in Ezekiel 28, 18. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. 
So I made fire come out from you and it consumed you. The fires of love and truth. What about Revelation 14? How do we deal with that? A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image or receives the mark on his forehead or in his hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. Amen. So what about Revelation 14? Well, the word, Greek word, translated brimstone or sulfurous fire, depending on which version you get, is the Greek word theon, which is a form of the word theos. If you study theos, you are studying God. You're studying theology. You're a theologian. Theon actually is the fire of God's presence. And so more accurately, to then brimstone or sulfurous fire, it should be translated divine incense or holy fire. It's the fire that comes out from God when he sits on his throne and rivers of fire come out from before him. And the context makes that clear because even in the Revelation text, it says they'll be tormented with burning sulfur, theon, the fires of truth and love. Notice where it happens. In the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. That's where the fire happens because it's God's very presence. What about the smoke of their torment rising forever and ever? What about that? Smoke is what remains after something is burned. Thus, it is language of symbolism. It's symbolic of the memory of what happened to them. How unremedied sin causes such suffering and pain and torment and ultimate destruction. And that memory will never be forgotten. For all eternity, the righteous will remember. Forever and ever. Key learning points. Our God is a consuming fire. God's presence is the source of infinite love and truth, described as fire in Scripture. But it is not the fires of combustion. It is the fire that consumes lies and selfishness. The righteous live forever in this fire. The wicked are consumed by it. Time for a roundtable discussion.